So let's go ahead and stop, I mean, and start recording. So today is gonna to be twofold. We're really gonna be talking about the methods section of a paper, you know, what goes in it, how to write one up. This is what you're gonna be doing for your next assignment, which is due next week. And we're also at the end going to be learning how to transfer your data from Excel into SPSS, how to reverse code some of your questions, you know, that need to be reverse coded, as well as how to compute your variable for your, for your scale. You've already done these type of steps by hand um, a couple weeks ago. Um, I do, I, I believe yeah, assignment two asked you as a group to like, you know, uh, total up the scores on your validated scale. So if you're using self-esteem scale, for example, it told you to tally up two examples. It's essentially doing the same exact thing, except we're gonna have a computer do it for us and it just makes our life easier. But first let's get into the method section. So what is it? A method section essentially describes exactly how a study was conducted and you know, what materials and measures were used. And so why is this important? Well, it's important for two major reasons, for validity and for replication. So a validity allows readers to assess the, the validity of your measures, and I'll explain what that means, and also the internal validity of your study, which is really important for next semester whenever we start doing experimental studies, but I'll explain a little bit what that means now. So um, an example of, let's take the measure depression, right? So there are actual depression scales out there that ask you a bunch of different questions and it outputs you know, a, a number between one and 20 and if you're above a certain cutoff, you, you're clinically depressed. Let's say in your own research, you just used the question, are you depressed? That's not really a good assessment of this. Actually, it's a horrible assessment if someone is actually depressed or not, just to ask them, are you depressed? So, you know, if you just said in your, if you were reading an article and, it, and they just said, we asked them about depression and we asked them about X, Y, and Z, and they didn't tell you exactly how they asked, you wouldn't know if it was a good study or not. If they said, we asked them, how depressed are you on a scale of one to 10, you would be able to look at that study and say, well, I'm not going to use any of their findings because, you know, this, this is not valid. This isn't really a good way to assess depression. Um, and then your internal validity of a study, you need to have a well-controlled study. So this is really important for experimental designs, which you'll get to next semester. But let's pretend we were looking at the relationship between sleep the night before and exam scores for this upcoming exam. What is it, exam two, I think it is. Um, exam two or exam three. So you're interested in that relationship. But some people took the exam at 4 a.m. and some people took it at 2 p.m. and some people took it at 10 p.m. So there wasn't any consistency. You know, whenever you look at your findings, are you really sure that differences in exam scores are related to how much sleep you got the night before? Or is it related to some other variable like when they did the study? I mean, when they did the exam. So, you know, in order to have a really high internal validity, you want a tightly controlled study. And in order to show that you have a tightly controlled study and you've accounted for all these different variables and thought of everything, you have a detailed method section. So a general rule is, you know, include enough information to replicate the study, but don't include too much information. And I think we're gonna do, we're gonna try a little uh, thought exercise to show you what I mean by this. So I'm just gonna randomly call on people to answer this question. So Sarah, how, or Sarah Francis, not, not, not TA Sarah, how do you make a grilled cheese sandwich? Just briefly tell me. Okay, you take two slices of bread, um, put butter on one side of each of the slices, put a slice of cheese in the middle, place it on a hot pan for roughly two minutes on each side, and okay. then that's grilled cheese. Perfect, all right, so. Let me move my laptop since things are about to get messy. So I have two pieces of bread. They are a bagel. I don't think that's what you meant, but that's a bagel. I have a giant slice of cheese. I don't know if you can really see this. A giant slice of cheese. I'm going to put it on there, still in the wrapper. I am going to butter the edges of this piece of bread and put it on a pan that is set to 737 degrees Fahrenheit. And I think I just burnt my house down. So we can see that that is not, you know, the correct way to make a grilled cheese. Or let me rephrase, you know, the instructions that you gave, I wouldn't be able to replicate making a grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, Alex, how do you make a grilled cheese sandwich? 
Um, you take uh, two slices of bread, usually from like a loaf, um, set the pan to a reasonable temperature, like, um, I don't know, 100 or 200 degrees. Um, butter the sides that are going to be touching the pan and then put a thin slice of some kind of deli cheese like American or uh, cheddar Swiss if you want and then grill it until I don't know if you like it like burnt or undercooked you can right. cook it until you like it. Sounds good. So I have my slices of bread. I'm not going to take it out, but you know, slice in the bread. I have this entire thing of cheese, uh, butter right here that I'm going to put on the bread, put it on the pan, and grill it up. All right. So you can see that you need to be very specific if you want someone. Let me get some bread. Off my desk. You need to be very specific if you want someone to be able to replicate your study or replicate your grilled cheese. Do we care about the color of the pan? that we use to fry the grilled cheese? No. Do we care about if we use, I don't know if you can see this, if we used a metal versus a plastic spatula, that really doesn't matter, right? So there's some level of details, there's some level of details that you don't need to include. But there are, you know, you do need to be specific enough that other researchers can copy what you've done. So within a method section, and that was an extreme example of like how to make a grilled cheese, but Within a method section, we should be seeing five different things. And this is pretty much the same throughout any psychology paper that you will ever read. And I'll pull up my own to show you. It's almost exact, it's exactly what you need. And we're going to talk about each of these sections in the next coming slides, but we should see participants, materials, um, or stimuli slash measures, the design of it. Uh, or, and then it's typically design and procedure, unless you're designed like your experimental, unless you're doing an experimental study, then you would separate these two. But for the purposes of our, our, our correlation design, design and procedure are the same thing and data analysis. So let's get into the particular sections. So the participants, we want to know who participated in the study. Um, you know, so this is going to include, so this should honestly be like three to a max of like five sentences in your, in your assignment and in your, and in your paper. It might be a little bit more in your paper in the final product, but basically the basic information we want to know is what are the total number of participants and how many, you know, boys and girls are there? What's the age range for your participants? Does it range from 18, you know, for our study, it may range from like 18 to, you know, 23 maybe if we have some people who are older and maybe we have someone who's 45 in our class, you know, the age range would be 18 to 45 maybe. And um, we want the mean and the standard deviation and we'll get into what this means in a little bit. Um, but we want the age and the mean and standard deviations of the age. You know, who was sampled? From where were they sampled and why did they do it? You know, for us, you know, it was students in, enrolled in 203 and they got class credit for it. You know, if you did the study in Alaska, it'd be Alaskan student, you know, so we want to know specifically who did it. Um, so this, this information under other information isn't really relevant for us in, the, in um, for your assignment or for your paper, but it will be relevant next semester. So I'm just going to briefly touch on it here. You also want to include information if you exclude anyone or anyone has to meet a certain criteria. So I'm doing a study next semester that looks at Instagram users and well-being. But I only want Instagram users. So if you don't have an Instagram account, you can't be in my study. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to say, you know, we excluded participants who don't have Instagram accounts. You only, they have to have Instagram. Um, you know, maybe some studies, if you want to look at smokers, well, obviously you don't want to have people who don't smoke. You know, they aren't going to be helpful for your data. So you have, you know, if you have any exclusion criteria, you gotta let you gotta let it be known in your participant section of your methods. Um, this is more so relevant for longitudinal studies, you know, studies that assess people, you know, across weeks, years, you know, long accounts of time. But did anyone fail to finish the study or did they drop out? You know, if so, you need to report how many people dropped out and why did they drop out or potential reasons why they dropped out. Um, you know, I, I am involved in a longitudinal study that spans like three years. And um, we have to report like if, you know, 15 participants drop out, we got to know why, because there might be certain characteristics of them. And, and these are additional analyses that you won't have to get to. But 
for the purposes of like an actual paper, you know, it may be that let's say a certain demographic seems to be more likely to drop out. That's important to know. But for the purposes of your assignment and your paper, really this should only be like a short paragraph. You know, we're talking anywhere from like four to six sentences. This really should not be that long. And I'm gonna show you an example. Well, there's an example right here, but I'm gonna show you an example of a sample paper that, that kind of really breaks it down to how long it should be. So here's an example and it touches on all the key points. So we have how many students, 40, from where are they at and why are they doing it? So in the, in the first sentence, we know how many people are doing it, where are they doing it, and why are they doing it? Right there in the first sentence. Next, we know the breakdown. We know there's 27 female and 13 male. Typically, I like to see percentages because I think that's more interesting to know that it's like 50% female, 50% male, so you don't have to do the math yourself. Um, but if you give me a number, it's perfectly fine. So we know how many are female, how many are male. What are the age ranges? 18 to 36 or 18 to 26. And then we have the mean and standard deviation. And we will tell you how to find out these numbers. Don't worry. Like this next assignment, it's going to tell you in the assignment just to put like X's where the numbers are, um, just because you don't know it yet. But don't worry, we'll, we'll learn how to do this later. But here's how you report the mean and standard deviation. So we see that it is, um, you know, we have an M equals, here's the mean of the ages, and the standard deviation of the ages. And we notice that M and SD are capitalized and italicized. So this is just a standard format across all APA papers. Next, you won't really have this information in your assignment or your paper because this isn't an experimental study. But for this particular paragraph, you know, we see that all students had previously smoked but aren't currently smoking. So that was a criteria that this particular study had. And then here's some reasons why, or a reason why three students dropped out. They didn't feel comfortable. So that's an example of that other information that I was talking about, these last two sentences, that we won't really have in our own. So really, I mean, you could do a good participant section for your assignment or your paper in two sentences. Though if you make it two to four, that's perfectly okay. The next subsection that we should be seeing in your methods is, what, let me back up. Does anyone have any questions about participants and what information goes there? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. All right, so next up, the next section that you'll see is a material slash measure. So what did you use in this study? All non-trivial, and I'll get to what that means, materials need to, con need to conduct your study should be discussed here. So for your particular study, all we really care about is that it was done online, right? Do we care if they were using a Mac versus a PC? No, that probably really doesn't matter. Um, if they were doing pen and pencil, which we would do if we were doing in person, do we care that they used a Ticonderoga pencil or a thick pen? No, we don't care whether they, they use pen or a pencil or what type of pencil. Just like going back, we don't care about the color of the pan or if they used a metal or a plastic spatula. It doesn't matter. But we do care that it was done online. Um, this, was, this is going to get more intensive whenever you do an experimental study, but once again, that's next semester. But really what makes up your measure section, your material slash measure section, is the discussion of your IV and your DV. So I suggest looking at the sample paper that's on eCampus, and I'll bring it up in a little bit after these slides, but also um, um, look at, look at your, your previous research that you've looked at, you know, the, the articles that you're using. You, for, your par for your assignment and your paper, you really should have two paragraphs here. You should have a paragraph about your IV and a paragraph about your DV. It doesn't matter the order because we're doing a correlational study. So IV and DVs don't really matter what's assigned what. But for these purposes, you're gonna have a paragraph about the, the scale that you created. So the idea that you created and designed questions for. And then you should have another paragraph about the validated scale that you're using. And so what makes up these, end of these two paragraphs? So each paragraph should essentially be the exact same format, but just the information should be different because it should be relevant to that particular scale. So for example, you know, what should be in this paragraph? So what questions were used? So um, you know, for multi-item scales, which all of your scales are, all of your scales are made up of anywhere from five to nine questions that you came up with. Give an example, give a couple examples, you know, and I'll show in my own work, you know, what does this look like? You know, they literally say, you know, example items included, and I literally list out a sentence or a question that participants were asked. 
what were the response choices? So was it one to four, zero to five, zero to six? You know, how did participants rate, you know, their answers? How are the responses coded? So what does this mean is, what does a zero mean in your scale? Or what does a one mean in your scale? What does a five mean? Um, you know, and the next bullet point, since you all are using multiple item scaled questions, you all have to add up your questions, right, to get one final score. So, you know, how are they combined? Were they added? Were they averaged? You know, all of yours are going to be added, but some scales you average the scores instead of adding them. But let, you know, but let your readers know in this section that, hey, we added up scores, and this is what a high score is, and this is what a low score means. For validated scales, you want to actually cite the original work. So I should see a citation whenever the paragraph about your validated score, I should see a citation about, um, I should see a citation that has the author's last name or names, or actually if, there, if there's more than three, once again, you use at all, and then the, the parentheses. And I'll show you what this means in an example. Does anyone have any questions about what goes in a measure section? Okay. So next is the design and procedure section. This is the same section, even though it's two slightly different things. So what was the design of the study? This should honestly be, you know, one sentence for your own paper slash assignment. Um, you know, you all, you guys all did a cross-sectional correlational survey design. This gets a little bit more intensive if you do um, like experimental designs. Like for example, I'm gonna say some things, some words that are scientific and you probably don't know what they mean. But if you would do a between study, which looks at like different conditions and each person is in a different condition, you're gonna to have to describe like where people were randomized into different conditions and here's what the conditions are. Or maybe it was a within study where you look at change, where one person goes throughout multiple conditions. So you have to, you just have to lay it all out. You know, what was the order of the conditions that they went in? Was it randomized? So you know, for the purposes of your own paper, this should be relatively short because you really all you've done is a cross-sectional self-report correlational survey design. So one sentence max about the design, two sentences max if you want to get fancy, but basically one sentence about this. But next you can write a bit about the procedure. How did you conduct the study? So all of you should know this because one, you designed, you, you designed the study, but two, you've also participated. So you know what you had to do. So in general, you should describe all the steps that a participant would experience from beginning to end. You know, how was the information collected? Were you got, I believe you guys were instructed to, um, uh, to do your uh, validated scales first, so that way you could report it on the actual survey. You were then told to go, you know, follow a Qualtrics link um, and to complete an online survey. So, you know, very briefly, just talk about how participants were instructed. Was there any debriefing? So at the end of whenever you took your study, did it have like a page telling you what the study was about? Your study did it, so you didn't need a debriefing. A debriefing is only really used in experimental designs because you kind of lie to the participant. You do not tell the participant exactly what you're studying because it would like affect your data. So um, like a debriefing is needed to be like, here's actually what we were studying and here's what you did. But you guys don't need that because no participant was lied to. You know, you knew exactly what you were getting into going in. You were just filling out some surveys and that's what you did. And then provide an approximate time for completing the study. So you knew how long it took you. Just say, you know, on average, it took participants an hour to complete the study or however long it actually took you to complete the study. You know, anywhere, it's probably anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on, you know, just how fast or slow you are. And I should mention that in the actual assignment, there's a, like, it goes in a little bit more detail about what exactly we'll want to see. And there's sample papers for you to look at so you can see what other people have written. Data analysis. So even though there's a section on this on the assignment, it literally, I think it just says like, don't do anything, like we'll do this next assignment or in a later assignment. Um, but here's a preview of what consists in the data analysis section. Basically, you need to describe what did you do once you had the data? You know, we're going to be transferring data into SPSS. You know, were any participants excluded? You know, like we talked about before. If so, state the reason and why. State the number and why. Um, I know a few, there will be, you will have a line or two in this in your own paper because there's going to be a few people who are excluded, excuse me, because they failed the validity check. So there was this question, there's validity check questions and make sure you're paying attention. I don't know how many, but I know uh, several people failed this question. So basically all of their data gets eliminated because we knew they weren't paying attention. 
What descriptive statistics did you use? You guys are gonna run frequencies to figure out how many males and females you have. And once again, don't worry, I'm going over this fast because this is, we'll have an, like an, almost an entire day on this. So don't worry. Um, what variables did you use to conduct your correlation analysis? And you just reiterate that we used our IV and our DV and you state what they are. And you, maybe you talk about the alpha level cutoff, which you guys probably don't know about, but it would be like we are, you know, we used an alpha cutoff level of 0.05. And once again, this will be, this is for a later lecture. So here's some general writing tips. Um, you're in a unique situation where you are both the researcher and the participant. But whenever you, and which never happens in the real world, right? You never do your own study. So when you're writing your own paper, consider yourself only as a researcher. So you need to write about participants in the third person. You know, going back to um, like the design, don't say we were instructed to fill out an online survey or it took me 45 minutes to complete the study. Like you don't wanna use first person at all. You want to use third person. So you say participants were instructed um, you, 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 don't, you talk about it in the third person. Always write in past tense. So never say like participants are filling out questionnaires. You know, it's always participants filled out. It's always past tense everywhere you write throughout your paper um, in the methods and discussion, your analyses, it's all past tense. If a sentence begins with a number, like if you're gonna say 37 participants, blah, 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 blah you write out the actual number. You know, you don't write the number 37, you write out 37. Uh, be formal and consistent, don't use slang. You know, this is an academic paper. Try to be consistent throughout the entire paper. Um, and there are some sample resources for you to do. So once again, if you don't know how to do APA, you know, look at the APA manual, look online, look at other sample papers. So let me, let me talk about plagiarism for a split second and then I'll bring up a, an example paper. But method sections really follow a formula. All method sections should look the same, right? This is the, this is the good thing about APA, is everything should look relatively the same. And it, it allows you to like, go to a paper and go write the parts and be able to pick out parts and, and be able to recognize them. So there's gonna be some overlap in your papers, obviously. But please write the method section in your own words. Don't copy, like, uh, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you an example paper, don't copy their entire paragraph and just change out your variables. Like put things in your own words. This is also, although you're using group data, this is not a group assignment. You know, this is all on your own. Make sure you're using your own words. All right, so let me show you an example. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is essentially what we should be seeing for your assignment and also in your paper. Let me zoom in. So, you know, at the very top of your paper, you know, just pretend that this is at the top of um, the next page, um, but it doesn't really matter in an actual paper, but for your assignment, it will. So, you know, it should be bolded, centered, and the top methods. And then you should have a bolded section that says participants. And you see, I mean, this is what, three sentences? So you should have something very similar, three to four sentences, and it contains all the information you need which is in the assignment, but also in the PowerPoint. We have, you know, where they are at, how many, how many were male, female, um, and the average age, and, and, and the age and the mean and standard deviation. Next up, we have the materials and measures. So here you should have, let me zoom out. Here you can see this person has two complete paragraphs and that's all you should have. The first paragraph is about they did it slightly different last year. They were allowed to use two validated measures, but you created your own measure. So you should talk about how, you know, how you, not how you created your measure, but all the information that you need about your own measure. So, you know, participants were asked to fill out a measure on social media comparison or on, you know, whatever your variable is. And you should talk about it. You know, how many questions were there? Um, you know, what was the response format? Was it zero, which means this, to, to, to five or three, which means this? And here are some example questions, you know, and you actually, you know, quote them out, or not quote them, but you paste in, like, here are two sample questions. And then you talk about how were they added up. Um, so this is slightly different, but basically you can say, you know, for yours that all scores were added up and a high score represents this and a low score represents that. 
There should be the next, the next paragraph should be something very similar, but about your validated measure. So you can see here, they actually use the self-esteem scale. So whatever measure you use, um, I should see a citation. You know, it should say, you know, for the self-esteem scale, it should say Rosenberg, 1965. And you can find this information on eCampus. Like it actually tells you what the in-text citation should be. And I can help you if you don't know where to find this information, I can, you know, let me know and I can show you. Uh, but this information is on eCampus. So you don't have to figure like who wrote the big five index? How do you cite that? It tells you on eCampus. But you can see, you know, it breaks it down again. They, they had 10 questions on a four point Likert scale. Here are some examples. Here's how they were coded. Um, and here's what the codes mean. So, you know, it follows a very similar, it, you should follow this exact same format when doing your own. Next, you know, procedure. Procedure should be like three to four sentences. You know, basically walk through, you know, participants were instructed to do X, Y, and Z. Here's the design. You know, we did a cross-sectional correlation study, um, you know, using self-report that was completed online. You know, they had to use paper and pencil because they were in person pre-COVID. Um, you know, they talk about why there was no debriefing. So, you know, your procedure should be relatively short, you know, three to four sentences. And then next, I'm just going to skip it, but, you know, there's the data analysis section where you talk about entering it into SPSS, you know, what you, and what you did. But you guys don't have to worry about that right now. Are there any questions about what your methods paper should look like? Okay, so on your assignment, which I will bring up shortly, it asks you, so it asks you for an appendix, um, and this is what an appendix looks like. So, you know, bolded, once again, everything's bolded, centered, appendix A. And really what you, this is going to be is both of your scales. So, like, if you have the self-esteem scale, it should look like this. You know, you should have the exact scale, you should have the question, you know, what the participants saw and the exact questions in a response format. I highly suggest, so like here's an example of the self-esteem scale on eCampus, and here's one of those, um, where is it, right here. So like what you really could do is just, you know, for the purpose of this assignment, I'll accept this, is just like take a screenshot of that, you know, or use clipping features somehow, and just paste it onto, as a picture, onto your uh, assignment in the appendix, I'll accept that um, just because I don't, you really don't need to like hand type this all out. I'm not gonna expect you to do that. But for your own, um, you know, for your own measure, you know, type out all your questions and type out the response format. You know, it was zero, it was zero through four, you, you know. So it should look something like, I believe I have an example. Okay. So if I see this, So here's a group from, here's an example of uh, my section 102 that use like social media comparison. Um, but you know, if, if I see something like this in yours, this is perfectly acceptable. You know, you list what it, you know, what the, what it's called, you have the response format and you have all the questions listed out nice one through six. So, you know, this is something that's okay for your own paper for appendix for this assignment. And it's okay to just take a screenshot of, you know, the validated measure that you use um, and paste it in. Does that make sense for the appendix? Okay, cool. Um, and then also remember, you know, you have to cite, I'll, I'll just bring it up one more time. I, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but you can see how, and yep, yeah, so, you know, she cited Rosenberg 1965. Make sure it's the right self-esteem, you know, the self-esteem scale. If we use the perceived stress scale, make sure you're citing the correct names for it. Um, but that should be, you should have a reference you know, there should be a reference at the very end in your references page, um, you know, for your assignment and also for your paper that has that measure. So like on your actual assignment, I should, there should only be one reference. You should only be referencing the validated scale. So whenever, whenever I get your actual assignment, I want to see, you know, something that looks very similar to this, you know, methods should look like I could just paste it into an actual paper and that's where you got it from. And then there should be a reference page and a um, appendix page. So that's what I want to see for this next assignment. So I mean, yep. So the next one is the next PowerPoint slide is about the assignment, which I'm going to bring up. Basically, you're writing a draft of your method section. 
Um, and we should note that since we haven't analyzed our data yet, just use X's or like the you know pound sign in place instead of numbers. Um, so let's pull up the, I'm gonna pull up the actual assignment. So this is the actual assignment. Um, once again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail because you all, you all can read, but you know, it tells you, you know, you're gonna want a participant section and here's what the participant section includes. This is basically just reiterating everything from the PowerPoint. Um, just make sure it has all this information. You know, we should be expecting, you know, three to five, three to six sentences somewhere in there about participants. You know, talk about your materials. There should be two paragraphs about your measures. You know, your, um, Yeah, so there should be two, you know, there should be two clear paragraphs, one that talks about your own measure, one that talks about the validated scale. And the validated scale should has a ref, should have a reference to it. And then next you talk about your design and procedure, you know, just a couple couple sentences about that. And then, you know, on a data analysis, you won't actually have a data analysis section, so you can just include the headline like in that example paper, but with no paragraphs underneath it, with no, nothing underneath it. And then remember, you're going to have to include the APA style reference page. So I want an APA style, APA 7 um, reference for your validated scale, as well as the appendixes, which include both your measures. So is anyone, does anyone have any questions about the assignment? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, you know, just as a reminder, I am always available by email about, you know, answering questions about the assignment. I do um, a lot of Zoom hour, Zoom office hours, and I, I'm even starting to do some on the weekend as well. Like this past weekend, I was on Zoom for three hours on Saturday, just waiting for people to come in and ask questions about the assignment for. Um, and I'll probably do the same thing this weekend as well. So if you have any questions about, you know, how to do this method section or the information that I'm going to be talking about over the next, you know, 30 minutes about SPSS and Excel, please let me know. All right, so this next section that we're going to be talking about is how to deal with your data. So first off, what is SPSS? It's a very powerful statistical software package. Um, you know, it's very useful, but there's some things you need to know. You need to provide data in the correct format. You know, you need to provide it how you want it, you know, and how you want SPSS to, to measure it. You need to tell it what statistics to calculate. So you need to know what buttons to press to calculate a correlation, to calculate the frequency, to make graphs, which we'll be doing, I believe, next week, um, but I could be wrong. Um, but you need to tell it what to do. And then third, you know, once you tell it what to do and it runs it properly, hopefully, it, um, you're going to have to interpret the output. If you remember the first week of class, I showed you some like crazy outputs for my own research. Um, nothing you're going to have to do will be that intense, I promise. Um, but you can see, so you know, even though it gives you an output, it doesn't tell you exactly what you need. You need to know where to take the information. You need to know what numbers mean what and how to put it into a paragraph. So here are some basic data entry rules, which I am just going to show you side by side. Here we go. Okay, so this is an example of my own data set for my own research, but um, let's follow along with these data entry rules to see what I'm talking about. So everything you know about a person goes in one row. So a row, you know, goes across. So we can see that this is participant 003. We can know, so basically everything that to the right of this, you know, following this is what participant 003 said or, you know, how they responded, what their scores, you know, all their scores go back to participant 003. So for example, we know that this is their loneliness score and you don't need to know what these variables are, just know that they are different measures. This is their depression score. This is how much they value happiness. This is their anxiety score. This is how much, how happy they are. So this is how happy participant three is. So if I were to go all over and this, now this thing has like a thousand something variables. But I know that participant three answered seven for this particular question. So for this particular question. So everything that goes across is about a specific participant. Different variables go up and down. So we know that every number or every response, doesn't matter where you go, is going to be about gender. Every you know, score right here is an anxiety score that you can match up with the participant by going back to the beginning and see their ID. So just very basic, it works very similarly to Excel, if you were to see this in Excel. And uh, it is important to note that all entries have to be numbers. So like if I were to change this data and say, 
or if I were to type in five, like it, you just can't do it. I, well, I, let me do 10, so you said exactly. Like you just can't do it. It doesn't allow words, so it has to be numbers. All right, so I, um, before I upload this PowerPoint to uh, eCampus, I'm gonna change some things and add some stuff in. I'm gonna do things slightly different than what these PowerPoint slides say. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip it um, and get to here. But first, all of you should have a um, Excel spreadsheet that I sent to you of uh, your group's data plus all the validated scores plus some demographic information. I highly suggest that you guys just pay attention to what I'm doing for the next like 10 to 15 minutes and then do it on your own whenever we do in the breakout room. So don't try and follow along unless you have multiple screens because you're gonna get confused because I'm gonna go slightly faster than probably what it takes you to do it. If you have any questions at any point, please raise your hand. So we can see that this is what, um, I'm going to unhighlight this. So this is what you should see. And now it's gonna be slightly different from group to group, um, especially starting at column M. Starting at column M in all of your data Excel files are gonna be different depending on how many questions you ask. So you can see in this example, and we can see this by the first line where it says, you know, section 103, group seven, which doesn't exist, but for this example it does, underscore one means this is the first question in their, in their scale that they created. This is the second question, underscore two, underscore three is three. Let's go all the way. So you can see they had eight questions. So if your group only came up with five questions or they had nine questions, you're gonna have different amounts. So don't worry if what yours looks slightly different, but it should all start on column M. All right, so we have all of these. We have all these validated scores. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is open up a new SPSS data set. Right, so we have a new one and this is what it looks like. We wanna be in data view at the very bottom. And now once again, I'm gonna upload screenshots of this to, power, to, to uh, PowerPoint so that way you can follow along step by step. But we're gonna wanna to to be in data view. So all we wanna do is copy over the data. So I don't care about these first two things, right? I just want the data. So I'm gonna start here, which is you know, the, the first participant and their first ID. I'm gonna go all the way over, go all the way down. So I'm only copying data. Just you know, go ahead and copy, control, well, paste. All right, so all of our data is now in SPSS. It's that simple, literally just cut and paste or copy paste. But now you can see up here, our variables aren't named, right? It just says, It, all the variables aren't named. Um, you know, it just says variable, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we go to variable view on the bottom left, we click it, and now we can start naming our variables. Now everything is in order of what you said over here. So we know that this one is the subject number. And now I'm gonna mention here, but it's also in the PowerPoint, SPSS does not allow spaces in between when you, whenever you name things. So like if I were to put a space there and try to go on, it's like you can't do that. It's an illegal character. It's just a limitation of the program. So I'm gonna name this subject number and you can name it whatever you want, but I would try to keep it consistent across groups, across, across your group. We know this is gender, right? I'm literally just going along with what the Excel spreadsheet says. So it's all we did is copy paste. We know this is age. This is the year they're in, this is GPA. This is the perceived stress scale. And now I, I, I recommend you write it out yourself. So, you know, you say perceived stress scale. But for the simplicity of not taking up too much time, in this example, I'm just gonna do abbreviations. We know this is self-esteem. We know this is extroversion. So just bear with me for the next 45 seconds. All right, this is agreeableness. This is conscientious, conscientiousness, I can't pronounce that right now. This is neuroticism. This is openness. All right, so now it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so now it looks like we got all the validated scales, right? And we got all the demographics. So starting here, and it should start on number 13 for everyone because one through 12 should be the exact same for every group, no matter 
what questions you ask. These are all the same thing. So starting here, we can see that we start with question one. So I'm literally just gonna rename this Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6, Q7, Q8. And once again, if you only have five questions in your scale, you know, you're only gonna have one through five. So this example just has eight questions. All right, and so now let's double check to make sure we did this right. We can go back to data view and you can see everything is named now. So let's go to participant 1211, let's go all the way over here. I'm gonna highlight them in Excel so that way it's just easier to see where I'm talking about. Okay, so let's make sure that the number's copied over correctly. Just, you just wanna double check, right? So gender should be a one, okay. Let me go to the neuroticism score. The neuroticism should be a 95. Yep, it's a 95 in Excel. Let me go to their last score, and this should be a one. So question eight, no, uh, yeah, question eight should be a one. All right, it's a one. So we know it was copied correctly. If you wanted to double check even more, you could just go to random IDs and, and look, but we're safe to say I'm confident that it was copied over correctly. All right, so now we can get rid of Excel. We don't need this anymore. And now we have SPSS. All right, I'm actually going to bring up the PowerPoint. So, so, so that way you can see that I do have it. All right. So now the next thing to do is, and you've done this um, all by hand. You've done it all by hand. Um, we're just gonna have SPSS do it for us now. So you've all reverse scored, you know, in, in class examples, in homework assignments, you've all done this reverse scored by hand, but there's an easier way to do it in SPSS. Sure, you could sit here and say, okay, question three and five need reverse scored. So I'm just gonna go ahead and type in, you know, that's a one, that's a, and that's gonna take you forever and you know, we don't wanna do that. So I've written up step-by-step -step how to reverse score. Um, for the purposes of this example, I'm gonna say that we've identified that question three and question five have to be reverse scored. This is gonna be different for all of your groups, but um, for this example, question three and five. So what's the first thing to do? Go to transform, recode in a different variable, right? So we click this. I'm just gonna follow along with the PowerPoint, even though I know how to do it, but okay. So step two, identify which questions need reverse scored. If you don't remember which questions you've reverse scored, I mean, you could figure it out again, or you know, ask me if you guys can't figure it out. But these are all the questions that should be weirded in a way that they would, the participant would um, have to answer it in uh, the opposite way than, than what the, the, the rest of the questions are asked in the way that the rest of the questions are. I worded that very poorly. But we've already talked about reverse scoring, and you've already, you should have already identified which ones need reverse scored in your own scale. But, okay, so I've identified that question three so I'm just gonna bring it over. Question five, I'm gonna highlight it, click this button, bring it over. So we've identified that questions three and five need reverse scored. And next slide. Now we have to rename them. So the easiest way to do this is to just do an underscore R. Um, this denotes, this lets you know that this is the reverse scored item. It changed. So for question five, you know, Q5, underscore R, that's the reverse scored one. Because what we're doing is we're creating new variables. All right, so we've, we've named them. Okay, perfect. And we can see that we've named them and that it's worked properly because it says Q3 and an arrow Q3R, Q, Q5R. So we know we've done it right. And we can see it matches up very similar to what this is. Um, once again, your variables are gonna be called something different. So it's not gonna be called variable zero three, or you could call it that if you want. I just happen to name them Q. Um, and, it, and, it's obvious, and it's obviously it's not gonna be question three and question five, you know, it might be one, one and eight for you, whatever it is. Next step is to click old and new values. Okay, so it brings up this box and I need to remove these because this is what, it just remembers what I did last time. All right, so this is what you've done by hand, right? But now you just need to tell the computer to do it. So on this scale, it looks like scores can range from zero to five. So whatever it is in your own scale, you know, if it's one to five, like in the example on the PowerPoint, then you would do it this way. But so we start with zero. What is a zero if we're gonna reverse score on a scale of zero to five? Well, it would be a five, right? So we just add it. A one in the old value is a four in the new value when you reverse score it. A two is a three, click add. A three is a two. Click add, a four is a one, click add, 
and a five is a zero click add. And one of the ways you can tell that you've done it right is you can look, look at this box and say, okay, so we have our old scores are zero, one, two, three, four, five, they're all there. And it should be the exact opposite on this side, five, four, three, two, one, zero. So you can see that they've been reverse scored. Are there any questions up to this point? And once again, you know, I've go, I'm going through things relatively fast. So, you know, don't be writing down, I have to click transform, I have to click recode in a different variable. It's all step-by-step -step in the PowerPoint that will be up on the campus. All right, so now we can go ahead and click continue. And then there's nothing else we have to do here because it will do it for both of these variables that it will do it for all the variables in this box. You know, it will, it will do the reverse coding. So everything's fine here. Click OK. All right. So it should pop up into this new uh, window and it, it basically tells you exactly what you did. You don't need to look at this stuff. Um, but, okay, so we can see what it does is every time you create a new variable, whether it's your recoding or you're computing the score for your final scale, it puts it at the very end of your, of your survey. So we can see up here, it created two new variables and it called them what we called it, Q3 underscore R and Q5 underscore R. So now let's just double check to make sure it did it right. And I highly suggest you as a group do this as well. All right, let's go to question three. So, you know, just from memory, a, a four should be a one, right? Yeah, a four should be a one. So a four in question three is a one in question three reversed. You know, look at question five. So the participant set a one for question five. So we know the reverse score should be a four, right? And it is a four. You know, you can do this for any participant. So we know that this participant set a three. So what should the reverse score be? It should be a two. And if we go over to question three reverse score, it is a two. So we know that we've done it right. And once again, highly suggest that you double check. All right, so now you're done reverse scoring. You know, sure, you could have done this by hand and it would have taken you forever to do. It would have been really annoying. But SPSS can do it in a split second, you know, and once you get the hang of it, it honestly will take you, you know, 30 seconds to do this entire process of reverse scoring. All right, so now we have our new reverse scored. So now what was, what was the next step that we were supposed to do um, by hand? We were supposed to tally up the scores, right? Yep. So sure, you could do it by hand. You could sit here and go four plus three is seven, plus three is nine plus, you know, you could do it by hand, but once again, take you forever. No one wants to do that. So the way to do it in SPSS is transform, you know, compute variable, and let me reset. Okay, so now the next step is to, what do you wanna call your new variable? So I'm gonna call it um, our variable, or new variable, or new scale total. Call it whatever you want. Call it group five total, group six total, whatever you wanna call it. Once again, make sure there's no spaces. So then just do what you've done by hand, but in computer language, as weird as it sounds. So we know that we're gonna add up all of our questions, but we gotta ignore you know, question three and question five because they need to be reverse scored, which we've already done. So we click on question one, bring it over, press the addition button, do question two, press the addition button, we're gonna skip question three, but add the reverse scored one. So plus Q3 underscore R plus four plus, now we have the reverse scored five plus six plus seven plus eight. All right, so then we're done, right? We've added it all up. We can click okay. It's going to create our new variable over here. And let's see if I did this right. Maybe I made a mistake, but let's see if I did it right. So we can count it up by hand. We can do four plus one is five. We skip question three. Plus four is, is nine. 10, or actually we skip one. So it, we're still at nine. We skip question five. Let me just start over. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We skip question five. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we know that whenever we add it up by hand, that that's actually what we get, we get a 17. 
And, you know, I suggest just randomly going throughout every, you know, maybe do it for five participants just to double check and make sure that you actually did it right. It could have just been a fluke that that actually worked out to be 17, even though I made a mistake. So I would I highly suggest, you know, doing it a couple of times. Um, yeah, so that's essentially how you do a reverse score and how you compute your variable. Are there any questions so far on that? Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I should note that it looks like participant, whoever this is, and I don't, don't care, but participant 16 didn't answer anything for this particular scale for you know, these questions. Do not give it a zero because a zero actually means something. Like this score, this scale is from zero to six, so do not give it a zero. Just leave it blank because SPSS is smart enough that it won't calculate a score. You know, it doesn't give it a score of zero because a score of zero is actually something. Um, so, you know, if there's any blanks, leave them blank. So yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop capture.